Hi there, I'm the GDT guy, and you are on video two of a deep dive into a somewhat niche topic in the world of mechanical design, engineering drawings, and geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, aka GDT. If you like what you hear, please like and subscribe to the video so you'll get the rest of them in your feed. Please also comment with your agreements and disagreements and help me identify any mistakes I've made. And in the video descriptions, I will post a link to where you can find PDFs of all the drawings I discuss so you can pause and look at them yourself. Okay, let's go. I've been talking about this very popular method for locating parts. It uses steel dowel pins installed into a machined part made of a softer material like aluminum. In my example, I'm using a mil-spec 16555-647 dowel pin. Now, anything like this, I sure like to get my eyes on the actual specification document anytime I can. So I ran an internet search for all caps, no spaces, NASM 16555, and I found a copy of the specification. Here on NASM 16555, I scroll down to sheet 3, and I find dash number 647. This chart, which you probably can't read, tells me that I have a corrosion resistant steel. The nominal diameter is 250, and the length is 875 plus or minus 10 thousandths. There are specifics about the material, some properties, all important stuff. I'm going to scroll back up to sheet one where there are some dimension views of the pin and a table below. I see that on the table, for nominal size 250, the diameter of the pin has this limit of 0 0.2503 max and 0 0.2501 min. This is a precise feature achieved by grinding. It also tells you about the radii and the chamfers. These are relatively loose tolerance features that you ought to keep an eye on as well. Now this is a go-to dowel pin for me. There are many types of locating pin and this one is fairly plain. If you use something different, hopefully you'll still get your hands in the tolerances. If you use metric, this should be an easy transfer of knowledge. As with all things GDT, the system works exactly the same in millimeters. All you need to know is 25.4. There are more precise diameter dowel pins, but for the interface I'm talking about, where you have a machined hole and a slot as locating features, I don't see much benefit to those. The diameters of the pins are achieved by an efficient and controlled process of machine grinding, and they're often certified. On the other hand, a feature like a milled slot is harder to control, and as an internal feature, it's also harder to measure. The size limit on my pins is two tenths. And I'm thinking five or maybe 10 times that for the sizes of this hole and slot. And so more precision on the dowel pin is not really gonna make my milling machine more precise. So it doesn't really help me. Where I really need the precision is when I take these pins and force fit them into holes in this machined aluminum part. This can also be called a press fit or an interference fit. With these, the holes are smaller than the pin diameters, and the pins displace material as they are forced into the holes and become stuck in place. A little while back, I put on my thinking cap and came up with seven different ways to prepare the holes and install the pins. And I put them all into this cutaway part, which by the way, is something I would love to have as a prop, hint, hint. Each one of these uses a hole that I've sized as 0.2493 plus or minus four tenths of a thousandth. I got this tolerance from another standard called ASME B4.1, Preferred Limits and Fits for Cylindrical Parts. This standard is really great. It describes several different cylindrical fits and sorts them into types and classes. For this application, I like a fit called FN2, which you can find on table nine. I look down and I find that for a quarter inch shaft, it says that the limits of interference are plus 0.4 thousandths to plus 1.4 thousandths. And I ignore the standard limits for this. So my apologies for the speed math here, but what this means is that when the pin is at its smallest, 0.2501, we still need at least four tenths of interference. So 0.2497 is one of our limits. And when the pin is at its largest, 0.2503, we want no more than 0.0014 of interference. So 0.2489 is the other limit, 0.2497 over 0.2489. Another way to say that is 0.2493 plus or minus four tenths. 
And this is the way I'm going to choose to express the tolerance because I think this feature is going to be made with a reamer. A reamer is a cutting tool that really only does one thing, which is to open up drilled holes to a more precise diameter. It's usually possible to find a wide variety of different sizes. I found a .2493 with six straight flutes. A reamer cannot side cut like an end mill. It chases a pilot hole and then it's pulled back up out of the hole. Okay, back to my cutaway part that shows all of these holes prepped for dowel pins. I made this drawing of just the aluminum part and on sheet two, I put all these detail views for all the different holes. Let's go through them all, starting with detail A. In this one, the 2493 hole is reamed all the way through. The pin is pressed all the way to the bottom, which can be easy to control if we put this part on a table or if we hold a hard block against the far surface. Check out this near side chamfer here. This is going to help when we go to press in the pin. And 60 degrees happens to be the angle of a typical center drill. Center drilling is a must to control the position and orientation of this hole. Second example is detail B. Again, the 2493 hole is reamed through, but now we're using a shorter pin. When pressing in this pin, you can put a gauge block next to it to stop the press at the correct protrusion height. But it does seem like one problem with this one is that if something heavy is set on top of the pin, it could get pressed down flush to the top surface. So this third example, detail C, is meant to address that problem by running the pilot drill down through the part, but then the reamer only down to a certain depth. The idea is to press the pin down to where the pin chamfer stops on that little shoulder, producing the required protrusion up on top. Now this has several factors at play and requires quite a bit of craftiness. We might call it a science experiment. This fourth example, detail D, is like the one before it, except the pilot hole is blind. Now this one has several downsides. The reamer may push chips forward, which then get jammed into the hole and cause the tool to chatter. It might be hard to clean all the chips out of there and all the oils that are stuck to them. This blind hole also means that you will not be able to push the pin out from the far side if you ever wanted to remove it. Or, as Murphy's Law would dictate, you might even have a hard time just pressing the pin in because the buildup of air pressure down inside the hole. The pins can actually be pushed out over time by the air pressure. Now isn't that fun? This fifth example, detail E, is another one I think you want to avoid. We don't see a pilot hole. A reamer cannot produce this hole. The only thing I can think to do is to use a smaller end mill, maybe 3 16 or 5 30 seconds, and mill out this feature with a circular cutter path. Back when I was a CNC machinist, this would have been pretty hard for me to do at plus or minus 4 tenths, even employing all my tricks. I would have even struggled to measure them with the gauge pins I had on hand. I would have had to make a go-no-go -go gauge on the lathe. And there are also limitations on how deep you could mill this hole with a small diameter tool. Here, I'm using the shortest quarter inch pin. There's not much engagement. There's lots of protrusion. This is a recipe for crookedness or for being knocked loose. My sixth example, detail F, comes from my late great machinist friend, Jim. The hole is reamed through at 0.2493. But then we also ream a short lead in at a slightly oversized diameter. This helps to line up the pin so it can be pushed in straight. Smart. I always thought maybe you lose some engagement up at the top, but Jimbo said not to worry about it. Finally, example seven, which is detail G, came to me from a commenter after I initially posted this part on LinkedIn. This is a neat idea to use a far side spot face so the pin can be pressed to a hard stop and produce the required amount of protrusion. Could be handy. Let's wrap up with a few words about what size a pin you should use. First things first on this. If you are using a pin for its shear strength, by all means, choose accordingly. This chart on NASM 16555 has columns for shear strength. But my starting point is usually to use pins that are about the same diameter as the fastener I'm using in the interface. Smaller dowel pins have smaller tolerance limits to achieve cylindrical fits. Look at how this spread gets larger with pin size. In my experience, pins below an eighth of an inch or three millimeters in diameter are pretty hard to work with, and the fits are unsatisfying. It can be like working with little metal grains of rice. Yikes. 
For the protrusion, I would say you can go pretty close to the minimum amount required to engage on the locating features. You'll want to consider the radius on the pin and if there's any relief in the blue part. Any more protrusion than this starts to look like over constraint. The short protrusion is going to be more forgiving when it comes to the perpendicularity of the pin and the perpendicularity of the locating features too. So one diameter of protrusion seems about right. For the engagement below the surface, maybe you should do like the most that seems reasonable. I would try for at least two diameters. All this engagement is going to help with the perpendicularity of the protruding portion of the pin. This less protrusion, more engagement combo also reduces the amount of leverage on a side load that could move the pins around or cause them to come loose. Okay, so that's video two. In the next one, we should start seeing some dimensions and tolerances. GD&T guy, signing out. Yeah.